Kamp Okunjima ligt ruim 200 kilometer noordelijk van Windhoek en is een goede overnachtingsplaats onderweg van of naar Etosha. Okunjima is ook de thuisbasis van de Africat Foundation, een stichting die zich inzet voor het beschermen en conserveren van alle grote carnivoren van Namibië. Okunjima is een familiebedrijf, gerund door de familie Hansen. En vandaag spreken wij met één van de mede-eigenaren, Tristan Beum. Welkom bij aflevering 27 van Reis en Safari Podcast Explore. Kamp Okunjima ligt ruim 200 kilometer noordelijk van Windhoek en is een goede overnachtingsplaats onderweg van of naar Etosha. Okunjima is ook de thuisbasis van de Africat Foundation, een stichting die zich inzet voor het beschermen en conserveren van alle grote carnivoren van Namibië. Okunjima is een familiebedrijf, gerund door de familie Hansen en vandaag spreken wij met één van de mede-eigenaren, Tristan Beum. Welkom! Bij aflevering 27 van Reis en Safari Podcast Explore. Ja, en uh, als het uh, goed is, hebben wij dan nu ook uh, vanuit uh, Namibië Elise in de aflevering. Elise? Ja. Ja. Ja, ik ben uh, hier voor speciaal overgevlogen. Oh, heerlijk. Voor deze hey, en voordat wij overschakelen in het Engels uh, voor de aflevering, uh, heb ik nog even één yes. typische vraag aan jou. Uh, hoe is het weer daar? Uh, weer is zoals altijd strak blauw en zalig. Met een briefje. Oh, heerlijk. <laughs> ja, ik, 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 kan jullie, ik kan jullie er ook een beetje bij zien. Uh, en ik zie gewoon uh, uh, strak blauwe lucht en uh, mooi weer. En hier zit ik weer in de regen. Dus um, uh, weet Zal je, ik anders het even is gewoon. Ik een scenario uh, schetsen. Nou, doe eens. Ik zit uh, bijna in de, op een savanna vlakte. In een soort heerlijk lounge, uh, lounge lappatje. En um, te genieten. En de guinea files lopen voorbij. En af en toe een jakhalsje. Dus, nou ja. Niet ja. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's time to switch to English. Yes. Um, <laughs> before you're going to tell just uh, how perfect the weather is there. Uh, and uh, give a, a very warm welcome uh, to Tristan. Uh, our guest of uh, of this episode, uh, Tristan. Uh, we uh, really want uh, a proper introduction from you. Uh, but before we do that, uh, we always start our uh, uh, our episodes with uh, our famous famous dilemmas, um, and I will explain it to you. Um, we have we will give you three dilemmas, uh, and uh, for you uh, it is to answer them as short as possible. Uh, preferably, preferably with agree or disagree, or just with a short answer. And afterwards, of course, you can uh, you can come back uh, to those answers, and uh, uh, you uh, you have uh, given. Uh, well, we will give you the time to uh, uh, to tell a bit about it. Um, and otherwise, uh, we will come back to it uh, during the interview. So uh, so that will be uh, uh, all the time for it. Um, I will start uh, with the first one: agree or disagree. Uh, looking to uh, nature, uh, to the nature com uh, cons uh, cons cons So I will start again. Conservation. Uh, to the <laughs> cons <laughs> conservancy part of tourism. There's not much much changed if you compare it uh, to before 2020. Disagree. Disagree. Okay. Perfect. I I I, I think a lot has changed. Ah, perfect. Well, we come back to that. Um, uh, you have to choose Okunjima Camp without the Nature Reserve or Africat Foundation but without Okunjima Camp. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know that they are inseparable. They need each other to survive. So I, I cannot do without one or the other. 
I was hoping actually that you would I say I don't this. allow this answer. But if I, but if I, <laughs> but if you, if you really squeeze me, I would do yeah. without tourism and just look into conservation. Okay. Okay. Perfect. <coughs> um, and the last one. Uh, it's uh, it's the final question. Uh, if you have to pick one, what is your favorite African animal? Ooh, leopard by far. Leopard by far. So that's easy. Okay, of well done. Of course, Th this, is <laughs> <laughs> this is the hardest part of the podcast. So an anything after this will uh, will only get easier. Uh, is there anything you want to come back uh, on right now? No, I'm good to go. You send it go. my way. Perfect. Um, then, uh, then I will. Uh, I will ask you um, uh, if you're still. Uh, if you still want to go, uh, please introduce yourself. Um, sure. That is. A, I, I. I think we'll need a whole podcast just to, to, to cover all of that. Um, yeah. So my name is Tristan. Um, my surname is Burma. Um, I've been with Okanjima for 25 years. I pretty much arrived here when it was a smaller guest farm, but um, run so beautifully and, you know, by the family, um, which is the Hansen family. And um, yes, kind of being part of something special and seeing it grow to where we are today um, is, is truly something special. And I've kind of, kind of migrated through many parts of of the business and of the conservation project and at the moment my bigger focus is is on the marketing side of things okay so that's uh, and and uh, and for yourself uh, you you you've been born in uh, in namibia yes i was born in the north of namibia close to tsumeb and yeah. um basically was there for the first six years of my life but um, all my schooling and um, kind of growing up and, um, you know, after school was in South Africa, uh, close to Johannesburg, Pretoria area. Okay, okay, um, perfect. Uh, Peter, maybe nice yeah. thing to mention, like this boy, now big man, he was actually born actually where now Onguma is. Yes, Onguma really? used to be our family farm, yes. Oh, so wow. Well, yeah. like actually that makes the whole Namibia being like a village. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't, the big country don't, of Namibia. Don't go, yeah, don't go into our family tree. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it can turn to be quite, you know, um, yeah, interbred or, or, you know, something. It's, Namibia is a small place. And yeah. Um, yeah, we all know each other, and we, you know, so which which in its own right uh, makes it you know really wonderful because um, people work together and people share and people talk and um, you know of each other and um, help you know so in that sense it's it's really a good thing. But was it also before then before Onguma was the, the camp over there or it was already? Uh, oh camp? yes! Oh no no no. Cattle farm. Oh, early, early, early days. So they've been, um, I think, two owners um, with the current owner that owns Onguma. And um, yeah, so when we when we were there, we, we farmed cattle. That was what, you know, my grandfather and grand grandmother used to do. And um, yeah, my my father um, also cattle farmed and then later joined the mine in Tsumeb. Um, and, um, yeah, that's our connection to that whole northern area of, of, of Namibia. Wow. But oh, it's, for it's, example, yeah. during your studies and being in South Africa, did you always think, hey, I will, I will go back uh, and work Never at doubted it. No, okay. no, no. Well, Okanjima wasn't on the cards okay. then, but never, never doubted that I would come back to Namibia. Yeah. I think, you know, this... This red and 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 white and black and uh, yellow and you know it it just lives in your soul. It you kind of need that. So no, I knew I would come back for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even even from from the Netherlands, I can understand a bit about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back here. <laughs> yeah. And actually, you know, I have three boys at home, but you get this like you know. If my flight is delayed or cancelled, I will stay a bit longer. 
Yeah, oh, no, it's a Namibia is a special place. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, and and then uh, uh, Okonjima, uh, because um, uh, I did a little bit of research. Uh, I have to be honest; I've I've never been there, um, uh, uh, and um, uh, I did a little. You bit have of missed last out time. on life. <laughs> you know, it was it was really funny because we will uh, we will come to Namibia in in about three weeks, uh, and uh, oh, and I said. I said to uh, I said to uh, to uh, Elise when she sent me some pictures and I was doing my research for uh, for this episode. Uh, the first thing I was sending her uh, uh, on a text message was like, "Why didn't you book this for me?" <laughs> no, <laughs> so, but you yes. coming? No, he he has to drop by for sure. But he also wanted to see the dinosaur tracks, yeah. and he can stay there a bit. But he will drop by. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll yeah. see you then somewhere between yeah, the dinosaur I, I, track and and something. Yeah, exactly. I, I, we, we have we have some extra time, so I think we I think we will. Uh, yeah. Cool. Uh, cool. But cool. Okajima is already because I was I was reading in my in my research and I I saw it's it's uh, already founded in uh, 1968. Uh, do I say it good? No, like 1980. 19 yeah. 86. Uh, 86. Yeah, thank you. 86. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, 86. <laughs> and then uh, and then the Africat Foundation was uh, founded in uh, 1990 uh, 1996. Um, can you can you tell us a bit about uh, how how it started because I think there's uh, there's also uh, a, a bit uh, the same story like uh, like you just told about uh, Unguma. Uh, I, uh, if I read it correctly, it was also uh, also uh, a cattle farm uh, transferred in what it is now, right? Correct. Um, so the family actually bought this property in 1970. They um, they moved out of the Komas Hochland area, which is an area closer to Vinduk. And because there was no water on that property, uh, they struggled with cattle farming. And um, they needed a property. Obviously, they, they loved their cattle and they, that's what they knew. And that's how they made their life was with cattle farming and also the father was very involved in introducing the Brahman um, cattle to, to Namibia, which is a, 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 a cattle breed that does very well in, in harsher, drier environments. And the mothers are very protective of their calves. So it is a good, a good breed to have in Namibia where there's also a lot of predators, you know, that could, could kill your livestock or eat your livestock. And um, they came here uh, and found this property close to Ochivarongo. And Ochivarongo is known for good grazing area. So there's a lot of cattle farms in this area. And, um, and lucky enough, good water. And um, that's how they then came here, bought the property and uh, started cattle farming in those days. So, yeah, cattle farming was basically what the family lived off. And um, stock losses did occur to to predators, so leopards would kill some of their livestock. And um, those losses, you know, uh, if you put that into financial terms, it's it's quite big for a for for a farmer to lose a lot of cattle due to to predators. And um, they supplemented their cattle farming income by a bit of hunting. So hunting and cattle farming is what put the kids um, through university and allowed a holiday and, you know, the, 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 the normal funding that you would have for a family to survive and to, you know, be able to give their kids the best opportunities that they can. And, um, yeah, and then the big change came when the kids, you know, kind of took over from the parents. Yeah. And is it that you, it, that's uh, like also you combined with neighbors on farms or was the property enough, so, big so enough to, to do? What no, you th this property is about 6,000 hectares, the Okanjima original mm -hmm. property. And uh, when the kids uh, basically took over, mum passed away, sadly, quite early. And... Um, Dad kind of managed to, um, you know, continue the farming side, but it was never, you know, kind of financially usually successful. So they struggled a lot. And um, at some point there was a decision to be made whether, 
you know, they continue with cattle farming or the farm gets sold and the kids go and do whatever they've studied to do because everybody did something totally different, you know. So nothing to do with farming or agriculture or anything like that. And um, <clears throat> the kids made the decision that they would never want to lose this land. So they would make it work somehow. And in the meantime, there was also a big plight for predators in Namibia because a lot of predators were, you know, kind of shot, killed, poisoned, taken off farmland because of killing livestock. Yeah. And um, the kids, you know, didn't really want to do the struggle with the cattle farming and then decided that they would stick with the farm and they took up a loan with the land bank basically to have some money to... to, to so basically re-bought the property and with with some money they could send their father into retirement mm -hmm. so he had a little bit of money and could you know go fishing more often and <laughs> and and, and yes and breathe deeply yeah. and don't have all the financial stress and the kids took over <coughs> excuse me and it turned it from cattle farming and hunting to conservation and tourism and um you know and that's why in my you know, in the question that you asked me in the beginning, I said, you know, that the one can't do without the other. Um, tourism is just so important to conservation. If there's no tourism, and we saw that so clearly during COVID, um, that, you know, everything grinds to a halt if there's no money. Yeah. And the first yeah. thing that you do is you stop projects and you stop research and yeah. you stop, you know, education and you stop everything because now it's survival. It's about having something to eat and not losing the land and not yeah. losing your house and not losing, yeah, you know, supporting your staff not and... supporting your staff, not yeah. all those kind of things. Yeah. So th that's exactly how we survived. We cut back on anything that cost money to be able yeah. to just keep the ship afloat. So no conservation is um, enormously, it's like, it's integral to integral to, to the survival of 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 conservation and species, and even even communities, uh, communities benef benefit from conservation as well. So it's people, it's animals, it's 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 land, it's grass, it's the soil, it's the water, yeah. you, you name it. It's you know, it's all that stuff, and the money needs to come from somewhere. And tourism, you know, for us has been a, such a blessing. Um, it's it's provided us. Um, not just with the great money for, for the conservation projects that we run, but also for a, a good life for us and, you know, our kids and our staff and, um, you know, the development of the property and that we were able to, um, you know, increase the size of our property. So um, now the Greater Reserve consists out of four properties, you know, four farms over the period of time that we'd managed to buy up and turn from cattle farming to kind of almost rewilding areas for for conservation yeah. yeah but i think same if you look at cattle farming uh the you have s quite some land um animals roam uh you, it's hard work i can I, I, tourism is also doing good but it's constantly hard work because you also have a you have your responsibility over your staff, uh, your land, uh, the animals. So, I mean, it's not that now that you're into this profession and this uh, turn you took that it's now like ah, easy life. <laughs> no, it's definitely not easy life. You know, in the sense that tourism is also volatile in the sense that we saw how quickly it could disappear. Yeah. Yeah. Within a yeah. period of a week, we went from a high occupancy of an almost full lodge to having nobody for two and a half years. That is, yeah. that is shocking. I get goosebumps. I get goose. I get goosebumps. <laughs> yeah. I get goosebumps. I remember walking out to the clients at the dinner table who had just arrived in the country. We were their first stop, and huh. I went to their dinner table and I said, "Guys, I'm sorry, but I need to tell you to get." you know, to get in contact with your embassy, get in contact yeah. with your agent who booked your trip because you guys need to Fly leave home. leave on the first possible flights back to your countries. Yeah. And, um, you know, and 
and and my goosebumps don't go away. <laughs> they no, just get, yeah, they I just feel get the more same, intense. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's almost like it brings a tear to my yeah. eye because yeah. um, it was it was traumatic. It was it was traumatic. Yeah. You know, and yeah. then you and then you have to explain to staff, and you have to explain you know why we make certain decisions, yeah. and that was yeah. no. Yeah. Hot stuff. Okay. No, but still, because, good times. because... Yes, good times. Yeah. Good times. Good times. <laughs> uh, yesterday okay. was nice. We had dinner and Karen approached us. And um, because just to make it very clear, Tristan lives here. <laughs> it, it, it's a burden, of course, for him. It is not that Tristan just goes to Windhoek or quickly to Swakop just to, you know, you know, he's just a bit in the bush, but then he has an urban life. Definitely not. Karen and uh, most of the management and staff, of course, live here. And Karen was a bit complaining. Well, complaining. She moved to another house on the property and she had a, f yeah, a bit of a problem because the first week she had difficulty sleeping because of the roaring of the lion. Can you imagine? <laughs> How cool is that? We get, oh, we wow. get, actually, we get clients. We get clients, you know, kind of saying they didn't have a good night because um, the, the lions were too noisy. <laughs> and you think, you know, wow. And I mean, I am, I am you know, I'm, I'm not a world traveler, but I've traveled a little bit and I've lived, or not lived, I've stayed in big cities, you know, around the world. And, and a, a city like, you know, Amsterdam or, or Paris or London or, you know, Berlin or you name it, Singapore. Those cities never go to sleep. There's always a hum. No. There's always a siren. There's always somebody talking. And there's definitely that day is rubbish collection. Because um, <laughs> when I sleep in a hotel and you hear those big... You know, those big bins being yeah. picked up and loaded. Yeah, at five and, uh, in the morning. At five Why? in the morning. Why? And then it goes beep, beep, <laughs> beep, because they have to reverse 20 <laughs> times to get the position to pick up that thing correctly. Yeah. You know, and I think, what the fish cakes are you on about? <laughs> you know, lions roaring uh, when, when the bin noise is something that you can live with. You know, it's like, wow, really? Yeah. 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 Well, it's, it's fun. It's fun. It's it's a bit different than uh, than indeed than, than we have here. But in the other hand, I I live uh, really um, uh, outside uh, all the all the places because there's there's still a little bit of of uh, open open uh, country in the Netherlands, and I live in one of those parts, so I don't have those uh, <laughs> th those things like uh, like what you just told. Um, what I what I'm uh, curious about because um, you told already a little bit about. Uh, the nature conf uh, uh, conf um, uh, the, the the nature part of uh, of what you're doing um, uh, also uh, combined with uh, uh, with the tourism part um, but uh, can you can you explain to me because um, if if uh, you told like you started with like six thousand uh, acres of ground um, if I read it correctly right now it's about uh, 55,000 of acres um, if you compare it in the Netherlands uh, because I was searching for it if you compare it in the Netherlands to to well make it visible it's uh, it's as big as uh, as the completely city of Amsterdam um, uh, all and all the all the yeah it's it's incredible how, how big it is um, but um, uh, uh, how 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 does it start? How become how, how does it becomes from a um, uh, from cattle farm uh, to uh, uh, to a private nature reserve? So what you mean? What what's the first steps? Yeah, well, w w yeah. I mean, now it is. Uh, I mean, now it's 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 private uh, nature reserve. So I I also read that um, uh, that you uh, took down uh, most of the fences, or maybe you you took all of them already uh, already down. Um, uh, it's 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 you really have to uh, make a transformation from uh, we use it for cattle to uh, we make it we give yeah. it back to the nature. Uh, the animals come back. Um, well, uh, well, like that. And you also t maybe don't want the animals to, to go. No, so maybe also not. when you put the fences down, I don't know. How do, how do you manage it? How do you manage especially that wildlife site? So yeah. um, firstly, I mean, the size of the properties are very often, well, not very often, they are based on what 
the carrying capacity of the land allows. So how many heads of cattle you can have per hectare or per acre um, of land and what can it sustain. So that's why the properties here are big because it's a dry country and we must never forget that. Namibia is, a, is an arid country, you know, so uh, we go from really, you know, sand dunes and nothing I mean, vegetation-wise, to, to really um, harsh savanna and gravel plain areas. So uh, our rainfall is, you know, the deciding factor as to is it a good year or is it a not a good year. And this year is not a particularly good year. Um, I mean, uh, just here where I'm sitting and I'm looking out. It looks you know, lush, right? It, no, it doesn't. You know, it's, it's, green, it's greenish. It, well, it's greenish, but it's all weeds yeah, and no grass. no grass. You know, no. so and animals eat certain weeds, but but mostly eat grass. And and as a farmer, whether that's a cattle farmer or a game farmer, and that's an an, an a concept also. You know, that never used to exist. We never talked about game farming. Game was always something that you associated with free and wild mm. and open areas now these days we have these fenced in areas for game which we call um, island bound conservation because you put a fence around them my neighbor um, you know and I there's quite a few neighbors around and some of those are tolerant of predators and other game and some of them are not tolerant of predators and other game and some of them are hunting farms and some of them find that certain game species are not welcome, are in, are not welcome because they are in direct competition for the one grass yeah. blade mm. that's standing uh, out yeah. there with their with their cows so they rather want their cow to eat that because they yeah. can get more money for the beef or for the milk or for whatever it is that they they give so um so it 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 this whole thing about conservation and island bound conservation and turning a cattle farm to a conservation area is 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 a long and big process. Yes, you have to pick up all the cattle fences and take them out. And yes, you know you want to have some water points in your park. So you need kilometers of of pipeline from the borehole to the water points everywhere. You know you need fire breaks because the disaster is if I only have three blades of grass, and in the early rainy season I have a lightning strike and it burns down those three gr blades of grass, that's a disaster for me. So yeah. you need fire, fire breaks, you need roads, you need infrastructure. Then you need fencing. And if you put up fencing on your perimeter, that costs a lot of money because you're looking also at electrical fencing because you want to keep the predators in or predators out or anything that climbs or digs needs to be secured inside or outside. And um, so, yes, it's, it's a lot of work to convert a property from a cattle farm to a conservation area. But, but maybe same like with a cattle farm. Uh, you can only have a certain amount of animals to keep those safe and well fed. So exactly. that, that is somehow well, the, 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 the same as what you have here. So you absolutely as much as a cattle farmer has a management plan and a rotating system for his land and for his grazing and how many heads of cattle he can, you know, bring to prime um, so that he can sell it. Um, the same we have to do in conservation areas. We now need to we can't overstock with one species because it impacts on the other species. Yeah. Um, so constantly you have to look at how do you manage that. And and that is actually a very difficult part of, of, of conservation is because you have to make a decision on how do I, you know, increase numbers and how do I decrease numbers? If there are too many of one species, what do I do? And, and how do I do it? And what are my options? Yeah. And which option is the best for financially and the best for the animal? 
you know so it's it's sometimes hard decisions but is it that you that you do that yourself or do you really have a for example a wildlife manager manager who does that no thank goodness we have a wildlife yeah, yeah. manager yeah. that does yeah. that absolutely so um I, i don't necessarily have to make those decisions but um in the bigger picture obviously it's something that's discussed at our family yeah. level yeah. and um But um, yes, we have people that have to look into that and manage it on a constant basis. Like now, we had to we we have to be prepared. We see this is going to be a dry season, yeah. so we had to buy in, um, you know, a lot of extra f kind of food and fodder uh, for the animals, which will then be fed to the animals from troughs or from bales, yeah. depending on what it is. Yeah. And, um, you know, those kind of costs are, are also big costs. But that, that gets done with, within the park management of, of, of our whole setup. Yeah. It's quite, in, for example, such a person who's busy with wildlife. Is it like counting the animals, uh, checking, checking rainfall, checking where's the grass, checking things like that? Absolutely. And I mean, is it's something like... Y y Is that also that person also makes an Excel sheet, for example? Absolutely. You know, things like that. Yes, yeah. <laughs> the, the farm manager, obviously, he, you know, he, um, and these days, I think that's made farming, um, in a sense, for the younger generation. Maybe not for the older generation, but for the younger generation, there is so much technology, uh, technology yeah. and and new yeah. knowledge and easier available, you know, means. To, 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 to farm and to, to balance things and to yeah. see grafts yeah. and to, you know, physically um, kind of on paper understand the bigger picture. So that kind of stuff is, is, is fantastic. The older generation would struggle and that's also where a bigger kind of uh, an uneasiness between the younger generation and the older generation. You know, it's, it's very difficult to change something in somebody's mind that has worked for them for 30 years. Yeah. You know, so if they farmed for 30 years on a property and that's how they have learned the best way of doing it and the son comes in and suddenly wants to change a whole lot of stuff to new technology that dad just cannot deal with. Or that, trusts. Oh yeah, or trusts, exactly, yeah. trusts. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it, it becomes a very difficult thing to, to deal with. But but so so your your Sunday afternoon cup of tea with the family is like okay guys we have if too we many. look at this sheet we have <laughs> hundred too many oryx maybe we want a bit more honey badger um, and then how is it with the kudu Charlotte tell me and then you make decisions that's nice I like yeah. it's so, of of course. When we are here, we're now visiting here. Also, Julia uh, from the Windhoek office is here. We we look at your lodge and also where we are now with a, on a bit of a romantic side. Absolutely. But we are fully aware and that it is uh, hard work, but it's maybe also what we do with organizing our tours. It's lots of fun. And you're directly in touch with, with the product. And that is nice. And I think that sets Okanjima apart a little bit from others, which all do a great job. You know, it's not, no criticism. It's just, it sets us apart a little bit is we want clients not just to come here and always, I mean, to experience the beauty and to live the beauty, absolutely. But also understand what is a challenge and what is a problem and what is yeah. something that we have to deal with and 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 I think that's what our guides you know um, are able to 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 get across to clients so we find that you know we are usually either the start of somebody's holiday or the end of somebody's mm. holiday so we have a golden opportunity to to make that impression eh? exactly oh. and to and to yeah. answer a lot of questions yeah. you know unanswered questions throughout their holiday get answered when they get here because it's not everything is pretty you know there are some some sad and some hard things in between you yeah. know it wouldn't be life if it wasn't yeah. so um and we we just feel that all these things are as much part of an experience of getting to know a country and the people and the animals and the environment um so it all needs to be told in some way or yeah. form 
And is this also the You've part that uh, that that uh, mostly comes from uh, from Africat then? So that that's the if if you know when the clients go out on the activities that they do when mm -hmm. they stay here with us, they get a lot of information about the work and the the the, the learnings that we've done over the years. What 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 have we learned? What have we researched? What was successful? What was not successful? What do we not repeat? You know where we've made a mistake or seen that it doesn't work, and 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 we could change. And and that is something that's also really special about and and kind of grabbed me 25 years ago when I came for my interview. Is decisions here with the family are made quickly, and um, if something doesn't work, it's adapted and changed quickly so that it works yeah. and it's not you know we, we 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 kind of are very flexible and the family you know they they recognize a, a, a mistake and it's rectified and and dealt with and not repeated you know so um that's that's something that's really cool about the whole hansen family and in the way that they manage and run run their operations, whether that's the conservation side or the tourism side or the education mm -hmm. side or, you know, whatever comes. I think also because it's within the family, um, it's also, you, you don't have to be so afraid to step on somebody's toes. You just say, hey, you, it doesn't work. Yeah. So, so no offense, you, you have the same goal. So, Absolutely, and you, of course, you 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 all have your field in where you work. You have these boundaries, but the the common goal is yeah very clear. Yes, and 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 I think that's you know a really cool way of dealing with everything. Mm. You know. Okay. Uh, what I was what, what I was also wondering maybe uh, maybe can you first uh, tell us a bit about the different uh, uh, the different game uh, uh, you have on on the on the on your properties. Um, so we have we have I mean uh, our focus started off through the project in the plight to rescue or to help as many predators. Um, as possible and that's how you know africat got started and that's where the name african cat africat comes from uh was because we were very focused towards cheetahs and now towards leopard and um and so on our property we wanted to create an environment where some of these animals could live their natural cycle and in their natural yep. habitat where we quickly learned that you know this is actually not a a property for cheetahs because we're quite mountainous and um and very bush intense and cheetahs need vast open plains to do most of their successful hunting although they are they are you know adapting to bushland in namibia and um, surviving in it but um, ideally they need those big grass plains to to run so for us to kind of switch our focus to leopard where this environment is an ideal leopard environment and that was also the biggest uh, predator that caused the most um, stock losses in this area were leopard so it was kind of a natural transition going from cheetah to leopard um, and these days we are even less species specific because through our years of of, of working with with all kinds of different animals, um, we have learned that, you know, it's it's not just one animal that makes the world go round. It is by far the bigger picture. And um, therefore, you know, whether it's the grass, and I come back to the grass because without grass and water, no animals You're would lost. survive, you yeah. know. Lost. Nothing would live out there. So therefore... You know, it has to start with grass and water. It has to start with the land. It has to start with the soil. And then also all the little things that live there, you know. So from the bird life to the insect life to the reptile life, which nobody wants uh, to hear too much about. Um, you know, it's all there for a purpose. And, um, and as long as we um, respect, you know, what's out there and, and everything that you know crawls and squeaks and 
roars and makes big sounds, um, you know, as humans, um, we'll be okay. So uh, for us, it's very, very important that um, Africa has diversified to a project where we still do a lot of work with all kinds of endangered species, like, for instance, pangolin and brown hyena and all those animals. But um, it's very much also about the kudu and the giraffe yeah. and the zebra yeah. and the impala, yeah. the species that the client sees when he drives through the gate on the way to the lodge, you know, he'll already meet up with some of those yeah. species. And the begeisterung yeah. for those animals yeah. is yeah. what it's all about. You know, that's what, what stops them in their tracks. And, you know, every impala gets photographed from every side. And, you know, at the end of their trip, maybe they don't stop often for impala anymore. But in the beginning, if this is their first one, they will stop for every impala. And that, that kind of, you know, excitement and, and, and love and, and, and just experience thrill, you know, yeah. is so important. Just to see, for example, if you would come here and you and you just see the leopard and nothing more, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because no. you have to see the whole mix. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was lucky to join a night drive yesterday. I never did a drive night drive here. I did a, a earlier a leopard drive when I stayed here uh, with my mom in May mm -hmm. last year. Uh, she did also not want to leave, by the way. Uh, she's still here, but I don't know where. Um, she's she's baking the cookies. Yeah, she's baking the cookies. Baking the cookies. <laughs> Listen, we went on a night drive, and you go without expectations. Because you go, it's dark, you want to feel the, the wind in your hair, and you just, yeah, you want to be surprised. We start already with... Um, Steak of work, um, porcupine, sorry. Yes. Uh, and my biggest dream is to see a pangolin. It didn't happen, but we saw the closest. The second the, biggest the, the, dream. We saw aardvark. Yeah, special. And it's very special. Uh, just to be surprised by that. Or maybe you see an owl or something like that. It doesn't matter even if you see one special animal. But always it's the mix that one special animal, you see maybe a chameleon, but you also want to see, of course, kudu, your mm. zebra, and how they behave. That's interesting. Mm. Why do they behave like that? And those guides at Oikonima also explain everything very nicely. You and see, that's valuable. Absolutely, and that's also why some of our animals are collared and some of our animals are researched or tagged so that we can track them and understand better mm. Their secret life, you know, um, their life, their movement patterns, their territories, their, you know, their home ranges, their family structures, their interaction, their social life, their secret social life, their, you know, all those kind of things. Um, and um, this, you know, huge area, huge reserve, nature reserve, makes that possible. Yeah. And uh, we've got data on on animals that stretch over generations uh, which is is so awesome because we know who the father was we know who the mother is we know the cubs and we know who they've mated with and who their cubs come from and their lines come from and all those kind of things so but they still it, have some privacy right it, not for all like of that <laughs> lots of privacy lots of privacy <laughs> who were you so, cheating on that, yeah exactly <laughs> But can, can you tell me something? And we don't about talk the, out. No. <laughs> can, can you tell me a bit more about those research? Because what do you get out of it? Is it also used by, I don't know, by universities or for other studies or for... So is we have... It, what is it used for? Yeah, we have co collaborations with other um, organizations and also uh, universities and um, veterinary uh, faculties of universities. And, um, you know, so, yes, it's a lot of shared. I mean, the network of, of information sharing is, um, you know, the, it's, it's the times that we are in, you know, that it, everything is shared. Social media shares everything, you know, and the same goes for, for information that, that we find here. Um, you know, it's a, we don't need to recreate a lot of the wheels that are out there turning, you know. Uh, if we've had the success stories or the failures, 
I'd much rather tell somebody else to not repeat that yeah. failure. Yeah. And, um, you know, Instead so of therefore... Them finding it out first. For, exactly. And usually it's to the detriment of what you're actually trying to, you know, do something good for. So um, it's that, that kind of stuff is, is very important. So we share a lot of information, you know, with, with all kinds of different um, places. But for us, the most important at the moment is what we want to share is uh, or that we are trying to share is that this island bound conservation and island bound maybe i need to die um kind of just explain a little bit what it what it is it is a, an area that is fenced it's a, like an island in a sea of land around us um where you know there are different um sources of income produced on these properties around us and as we said some are pro predators and others are against it and some hunt them and some tolerate them and some so there's a mix and um, <coughs> to be able to protect an animal that we have an history with on the third generation we had to put a fence around it yeah. so no animals come in no animals go out and um, you manage whatever is on that island within there but we see the future of conservation kind of going in that direction where we will not have, you know, wild open spaces, um, you know, in, in future generations anymore. And, 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 and that's sad to think about it. And I don't want to be, you know, kind of pessimistic about it, but, um, you know, the need for land and the, the, the population of humans and, and all of those kind of things, you know, kind of impact on the bigger picture. And if an animal, you know, doesn't have a, 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 a value, then, you know, why should anybody look after it? Mm. So, and that's another thing that tourism adds to it. Tourism adds gives it a value, value. Yeah. gives it a value. Yeah. And that impala that puts that first smile on somebody's face when they drive through the gate, that is an enormous yeah. value for that animal yeah. Yeah. but, in, and, that, but um, in that sense that that island that you created for me is already so big and so well maintained and so well taken care of that it is the yes. wild savanna you understand yes i uh, yes and i think that's that's where we need to that information yeah is is so important because um in namibia you have national yeah you know, parks, yeah. which are, are seen to be, you know, 20 times, yeah. 20 times the mm -hmm. size of Okongjima. But, um, but it's, it's, it's seen as the wild area. And then you have communal farmlands where still a lot of animals live amongst communities that farm cattle and livestock and mm -hmm. all kinds of things. But um, the challenges there are as big as they are on commercial farmland between predators and livestock. Yeah. And um, so... It is, you know, it's it's those kind of things. Now, private game reserves yeah. or nature reserves are starting to, you know, pop up more and more. And the great thing about it is that um, we were just thinking the other day um, that we we know that a property kind of, not the next one next to us, but the, the, the one further has just been mm -hmm. bought up by another game reserve, <coughs> which brings that game reserve so much closer to us. So now there's only one property between us and that game reserve, which is already a, a very, very big game reserve, um, that if, you know, somehow this in-between property is also taken into the conservation area, yeah. we could actually open up between conservation areas. Yeah. Um, if, you know, egos yeah, I, I, and people and uh, that you know is sharing is <laughs> yeah. caring Sh sharing but, but it's very share, difficult you share also what you yeah. build up a lot so that's yes then your heart must be really big absolutely <laughs> absolutely so it's not an easy no. one no. but at least it makes a dream which potentially could be yeah. uh, amazing for the animals yeah. you know be so because I, I agree with you what you also just try to touch on just now like some people think oh private game reserve hmm, it's all set up yes but it's not it's also natural oh, absolutely. people uh, uh, the people the animals behave as wherever they would behave because yeah. it's big it's big it's nature and and when you run a property like this 
you know so so if i if i take our our tourism side of things which are say three um lodges mm. and um you know the amount of clients that can stay in these lodges and the amount of staff that you employ for a lodge mm. um to run it at you know the optimum and 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 the, the best quality of service to the client um you know that's a lot of employees mm. and um if you think about the salaries that go to those employees um that reach families well, far be, from here yeah. because their families yeah. don't live here no. you know necessarily yeah. so their fa- families are hundreds of kilometers i mean we we talk about an an 8 hour drive from here to their families um the money that reaches those families in communal areas is 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 so important and so important to to the people and to the economy and to yeah. you know what what kind of works so tourism you know when it comes to income is 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 valuable to yeah. the country and to to the people um and 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 you know needs to be recognized for that because a cattle farmer you know traditionally would not employ you know 200 staff members no. and we are close to 200 staff members so we are talking about i think now we are at a 168 or 186 i do the same thing yeah. with the figures that you do <laughs> no, sorry, yeah. <laughs> uh, dyslectic <laughs> dyslexic yeah. yeah so um 86 i think we are on 186 staff members so um you know and and that's a lot of people that 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 a property employs a, a cattle farm would you know if it was a big cattle farm would employ maybe 12 people yeah. you know and if yeah. it's a smaller cattle farm you'd have two families you know yeah. of, of eight people so yeah. well so i yeah, think it's such a, a big difference job, keeping a lot of animals yeah. safe and supporting families so that's nice mm. just to just to explain a bit of course i uh I must say I'm treated very well and I stay at bush camp. <laughs> there is also the bush suite. There is the villa. That is very nice also. More also if you're a big family and you bring lots of cash. Uh, plains camp is also pretty. And you can camp here in the Umbarocco campsite. And that whole mix that needs that 186 uh, persons to keep everything uh, clean and tidy and well serviced. Yeah. 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 Can you can you tell a bit because this is this is a uh, a good introduction from you uh, Elise uh, about about all the places that that you have at at Okajima. Can you tell us a bit more about um, well, I don't know what people can expect if they if they arrive. Um, uh, what do you have on 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 your property? Um, uh, well, can you give us a, bi- a bit of an impression about it? S- yeah, no, of course. Um, yep. So um, when we 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 started off really small as a as a small guest farm in the early days of tourism, uh, pre independence and. Um, we, you know, it, 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 it was literally um, when there were guests, the kids moved out of their bedrooms, took all their posters of their, <laughs> you know, kind of Hollywood and um, a, a, a music heroes off the wall and replaced them with a big lion picture and a big, you know, kind of leopard picture <laughs> and everything. And the kids moved out of their rooms to, 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 to accommodate and to host the guests that were there. And um, eventually it was possible to build two rooms. So we built two rooms. And then it was possible to build four rooms. And My goodness. eventually we had ten rooms. And we thought, holy hell, how are we ever going to survive 20 <laughs> people, you know, and feed them and keep them, uh, you know, kind of happy and entertained and everything. And, um, you know, and basically tourism grew from there. But for us it was also very clear that we didn't want to exclude anybody from experiencing what we can tell, what we can, what we can basically give as information. So we wanted to um, build properties in different categories of luxury 
and um, you know obviously also what they cost uh, when you stay there so we developed um, you know three kind of levels and and have the camping site so in that sense being able to cater for anybody and anybody's kind of expectation of the bush safari luxury um, you know and um, and still do an activity because our activities are the same activities whether you stay in the villa um, you know or whether you're staying in the plains camp um, or at the campsite so therefore everybody has the opportunity to see what we do yeah. and get that information so i hope that answers your question yeah it does yeah yeah so and uh, and also um uh, uh for everybody i mean there's the the well let's call it basic things but um uh you have a restaurant uh, a swimming pool all all those uh people can also use right exactly so all lodges have all amenities that you would expect um, you know, to have. So um, whether you're booked in the Plains camp or in the Bush camp or in the villa or in the suite, you know, everybody's got got pools, uh, restaurants. So it's not shared. It's when you're in that lodge, you basically use the facilities of that specific uh, product. Yeah. Obviously, if you use facilities and the really high end products like the villa and the suite, you have a private host and you have a private guide and your times are more flexible as to activities as to where you want to go when you want to go what you want to see um you know those kind of things whereas if you are in the lodges you have to kind of fit a little bit into the um time schedule to make things kind of just run smoothly yeah. you know so we have departure times for activities and yeah. you know meal times are kind of in between those activity times so you need yeah. to kind of you know kind of just abide by those but if you want to be as flexible as you want to be and make your own decision about what you want to eat when you want to eat it and when you want to see it then um, you go into the high-end properties where everything is pretty much yeah. done as the client wants yeah. it done what wow. i what i like also from staying here we were just having breakfast and then this lovely french couple came back from their rhino trekking and last night also the that man joined uh, for the night drive and the fun part of also being around more people look the private villas beautiful and it will definitely suit a lot of people but that shared joy of, hey, what did you see? And uh, that excitement is nice. So it's always also nice to be around. Absolutely. It's those campfires. You yeah. know, every lodge has a fire yeah. and um, or multiple fires, you know, burning. And especially now going into our winter season, um, you know, it's it's such a cozy place. You know, it's a, it's a glass yeah. of red wine or a gin and tonic or a beer and um, shared experiences, you know. So... And that brings lots of giggles and um, eventually you find even that clients, you know, suddenly that have been on the same activity will share a meal. You know, yeah. can we put the tables together? Uh, we want to have breakfast together, you know, that kind of thing. So that happens often, yes. Yeah. And of course, been before. Well, oh, my goodness. We get a lot of people returning, you know, a lot. A big part of our clientele, yes, are, are been befores and um, our people that, you know, kind of follow the projects and want to see where we are now and what we've learned and, you know, get the latest information. And and we have people that get to know some of the individual cats, you know. So, oh, what's happened to uh, that wow. cub? And, you know, uh, where did they find their territories? And all these kind of things. So um, it becomes quite, you know, quite familiar, but also focused, you know, when, when you get clients coming back to actually see an individual animal that they've experienced yeah. on the property here, being that a brown hyena, being that a pangolin, being that a you know a leopard, um, it, it's it's very special. I think P Peter wants to be uh, been before. Yes, Peter. <laughs> yeah, I want to. You need yeah. to be. A, I oh, I still think you need to speak to this person that booked your trip, um, <laughs> because yeah. I think yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, I guess I know I know her a little. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know this person, so uh, so we will talk later. Yeah, 
Yeah. yeah okay, well, good. to finish it to to finish it off, I have I have one more uh, one more question for you. Um, I started uh, in uh, in the beginning of the episode uh, with uh, asking you, uh, uh, looking to the nature con uh, conservation uh, part of tourism, there's not much much changed uh, compared to before 2020. Um, this question came from me because I saw a movie, uh, a little movie from you on YouTube. Uh, where you told uh, that it was a that it was well a, a wish from you that you said oh I hope that uh, that there will be uh, there will be change um, is that something still uh, uh, also for the future uh, like like more like like uh, what you want or um, uh, is there a, is there a, a long term uh, dream for you. I think personally, yes, you know, and, and I think I, I know which one you, you're referring to. And, and, you know, something I think a lot of perf people um, learned during, um, you know, the lockdown periods in our lives is um, how little notice um, a lot of us take of the greener environment around us and for me that would be my biggest my biggest dream is for people to just notice the beauty of nature as big or as small and then at the same time is to respect that and know that it is not something that is just there every day because it might not be there anymore if we don't you know take note of it and don't appreciate it and yeah. don't see the beauty and um, in it and the value in it and um, so for me that that is you know that's my personal dream i think i share that dream with a lot of people in conservation is you know it doesn't matter how big or small or how cuddly or furry or uncuddly or scaly or you know whether it's got fins or feet or um, you know, or no feet at all, or, you know, it, it everything has its place and we need to be able to respect and see the beauty and the value in all of those kind of things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Peter. Well, thank you so much uh, for yeah, uh, for your time and, uh, <laughs> and, 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 well, telling telling all those, uh, all those beautiful uh, stories uh, uh, to us. Um, I will uh, I will finish this episode in uh, in Dutch uh, for a little. Um, dankjewel uh, voor het uh, luisteren naar onze 27e aflevering van de Reis en Safari Podcast Explore met Tristan Boom als onze guest of honor. Vond je dit nou een leuke podcast? Uh, stuur hem dan ook door naar je vrienden, je families en je collega's en abonneren kan natuurlijk uh, via Spotify, Google of Apple Podcast zodat je een berichtje krijgt bij een nieuwe aflevering. Uh, hebben wij nou iets cruciaals vergeten of wil je iets met ons delen? Dan doe je dit via Instagram of Facebook uh, via explorepodcast.nl. En wil je nou zelf op reis naar Namibië of Botswana? Neem dan eens een kijkje op de website van explorenamibië.nl of volg ze op Facebook, Instagram uh, en dat doe je via explorafrikatravel nl. Nou, deze podcast die verschijnt maandelijks en de volgende aflevering uh, dan uh, gaan wij jou inspiratie geven over hoe je verschillende routes uh, kunt samenstellen uh, door Namibië en Botswana. En hoeveel tijd je daar ook voor moet uittrekken. Nou, nogmaals bedankt voor het luisteren. Uh, nogmaals uh, bedankt ook uh, Tristan. Thank you very much. En, uh, nou ja, en tot de volgende keer. Bye bye. Tot de volgende keer. Bedankt. Bye dankie. Dankie. <laughs>